Hello, everyone, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I have been told that we are not loud enough on the previous <laughs> episodes. Yes. So I'm giving you now. So if it's turned up really high, maybe turn it down a little bit if you're listening to a bunch of our episodes in a row, so I don't blow out your eardrums. Yeah. So because this, this one's going to be louder than the other ones. Maybe. M- maybe. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics no, podcast. You're gonna, no, you're not going to speak louder. You're going to do gonna the audio louder balancing. Too. I'm louder. also going to speak louder. Okay, sure. I just don't think that's sustainable. No, it's, I think um, you should it's speak with your normal podcast voice, which is louder now. <laughs> <laughs> You've so, decided it's going to be louder. It's going to be louder. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm Cherry. Together, we talk about topics with Chinese characteristics. We are finally Cherry. Getting to the burning of the summer palace. Oh my god! The great shame. The great shame. Where all of the stuff in the Victorian Albert Museum and the yeah. British Museum and that's why China needs to be strong. It's true. Under the party leadership <laughs> to, to prevent something like this happening. If you are new to this podcast, I'm sarcastic. I was being sarcastic. <laughs> I like to put out a disclaimer mm-hmm. just in case. Not a tanky podcast. We've we've talked about the McCartney expedition up through the Opium War to the Arrow War to what? What are you doing? <laughs> I was trying to not make a noise. Okay. Anyway, let's keep going. Down the Arrow War. Now we're at the end stage of I guess the original the opening of China, quote unquote. Not that China wasn't open, just wasn't as open as some white people wanted. <laughs> so, um, yes. So you're Lord Elgin. You're in charge of the British half of these, the expedition, the Allied expedition to Beijing. Yeah. Your counterpart is French. It's 1860. You're back. You were already in China once. You took Canton. You captured the governor there. Yeah, Ming Chen. You got China to agree on a treaty they didn't want to do. 1859, the next year, your brother went to get the treaty ratified. They blew up his ship. It's not starting to sound like you're 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 narrating a video game's like premise. I know. So you're talking to the player. Like I this am, is what you're gonna be. This is this is you. You're Elgin. Yeah. You don't want to be here. Probably. You don't want to be back in China again, negotiating the same treaty for the third year in a row. Someone has to do it to protect Great Britain's Britain honor. Honor. Yeah, yeah I guess. You, you and the cer- face. You certainly can't have a standard Qing official sign it like the Americans did. You have to get the emperor to sign it. Even though it's perfectly acceptable. Yes. If the standard one just signs it. Yes. So. And America did get, you, you know. Yeah. So you've got 20,000 troops with you. Yeah. Which is good. But one third of those troops are French, which complicates matters because now this is a multi-party <laughs> arrangement, right? Yeah. The French have their own feelings and opinions on things. Do they? Really? Yeah. I, I'm being sarcastic. Oh, okay. Of yeah. course they do. <laughs> They're the French. So as we've spoken about before... Elgin has a delicate task. He has to get the treaty signed. He's got to soothe British feelings. Because remember, Britain has a press. They have elections. Mm. You know, we got to show that we're tough on China. China, yeah. Yeah, just like today. I I don't know if today the the, the UK is... is... Well, America, you got to show you're tough on China. Yeah, the UK is very much no need to be tough on China. As long as you can make money. That's true. From China or with China. Singapore of of the Europe or whatever. He can't go in and just burn down Beijing, even if he could, because then the Qing dynasty is probably going to fall. And then who are you going to make a treaty with then? Yeah. Lesson 101. Make sure you have someone you can still negotiate with. <laughs> yes. That's a lesson from a lot of wars. Yeah. If you, if you don't have anybody left to surrender, it makes things difficult. So this means some things that would normally be a much bigger deal. For example, last summer, when the Qing dynasty sunk the British like embassy fleet, a uh, glorious moment. Yes. <laughs> the Taku <laughs> forts <laughs> blew them up and they had to run away. It's sort of being minim- minimized. Mm. Obviously, they're back with an army to send the treaty. But when you consider that this whole thing originated from something as minor as the Arrow, which is a boat in a harbor mm-hmm. with eight people on it, yeah. who are Chinese and may or may not have had a British flag, <laughs> you realize the, the British are kind of trying to not make things become a bigger deal than they already are. Mm-hmm. I mean, wars, wars have been started for, yes. for, for, la- for less. Yes. Yeah. Another incident, which they're kind of trying to not make too big of a deal of, is the famous Private of the Buffs, which was a story reported in the London Times, turned into a famous poem. So the Buffs is a regiment, a, a British Army regiment. Supposedly a British private soldier 
along with some Sikh Indian troops, were captured in the beginning of the campaign and were ordered to perform the kowtow to a Chinese Mandarin, Chinese mm. official. The Sikhs obeyed. The British soldier, white British soldier, refused mm -hmm. and was executed. And the Sikhs came back and told the story. Wait, to a Chinese official? Yes. Huh. They were to, so you not know, even to the, to the emperor? No, but to, you know, for the emperor, right? In, in, right, in, right. In, the, 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 the Chinese official embodies yes. the emperor. So this almost certainly did not happen. It was reported in the Times. There was a famous poem about it. It became briefly part of pop culture. But they made it up. Probably was made up. Okay. And presents some untrue generalizations about Indian troops being, oh, you know yeah, what I mean, less, and, uh, less honorable or whatever. Not rep well, rep not representing the, the... The crown. The crown properly. Yes. But it, it does show that... Even though they were colonized that, and... What was that? Even though they were a colonized pe colon. Yes. Colonized mm -hmm. people? Yeah, can't that... can't get a dig, can't not get a dig in on them and say that even though we colonize you, you're not loyal enough. Yeah, um, exactly. But it does show that there was already a feeling that the Qing were executing prisoners. Mm. So this wasn't necessarily anything new. What's going to happen with Parks and Locke and the whole crew we talked about last episode that got captured mm. by the Qing? British and the French trying to not create new incidents and just trying to get this over with. Um, trying to seal the original deal, mm. more or less. So the treaty is just too important. Now, of course, it has to be stated, the British and French are committing far worse crimes on a daily basis than anything that the Qing are doing to them. Yeah, um, but they're white. <coughs> exactly. Mm. It's okay if they commit it. Well, yeah, sure, of course. They're, they're civilizing these people. So, you know, they're turning entire towns into military bases, as we discussed last episode, kicking yeah. out everybody on the street. Yeah looting food and supplies money all of which entailed, just from civilians just from civilians just yeah. from random people chinese civilians yes all of which entailed chinese civilians you said it fine the first no i said it's chinese civilian burdens. sure <laughs> no 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 do, do the right one <laughs> i'll do the right one chinese civilians so all of which entailed a fair number of what we would now consider war crimes yeah however when harry parks and henry locke his secretary sort of like chief of staff basically of elgin get captured along with their entourage it was a clear escalation from the british perspective and while they had while parks and Locke had been playing fast and loose with the flag of truce mm. using it to get behind enemy lines and scout things and pressure people um, and parks was often very rude to ching officials mm. it remains that they were in the midst of negotiating a deal for the treaty signing now elgin had lost his chief negotiator and administrator let me remind you though the British had no issue capturing Qing Chinese officials, such as Governor Ye Mingchen of Canton, when they yeah. felt they needed to do it. Yeah. So, you know, and Ye Mingchen is also going to die in captivity yeah. like a year later. Yeah. It's not like the British aren't doing this too. But let's talk about things now, because the previous episode was very heavily from the British perspective. Yeah. Let's talk about things from a Qing perspective. Mm, finally. The Treaty of Friendship, <laughs> which is what this is, the Treaty of Tianjin. <laughs> is not something the Qing Empire wants or desires, Yeah. but is instead being forced into at gunpoint. While the British paint the Qing court as ridiculous and overly concerned with ceremony, such as the kowtow, mm -hmm. from the Qing perspective, the British are equally, if not more, focused on symbolism. Yeah, well, they wanted the emperor to sign it. Yeah, right. They can't have anybody else sign it, yeah. right? So the British are also being ridiculous here. Mm. Perhaps more ridiculous because they're the ones that send an army. So, yeah, also China's not going to... London. Yeah. Yeah. Demanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wolf Warrior 3. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Wolf Warrior 4. No, well, if, um, that, if that's ever going to come out. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to talk about that sometime. Yeah. Um, so, but this is an edict written on 6th of September. So Parks and Locke were captured on the 18th of September. So okay. this is a couple weeks beforehand. They're still making their way towards Tianjin. This is written by the emperor, likely influenced heavily by Sushi. Mm. Sushi, of course, is going to be essentially ruling China after this for the next 50 years. Yeah. Favorite concubine, mother of the next emperor. Yeah. Um, Most powerful woman or person in yeah. China. Yep. So this at that is, time. At the time, yeah. So this is the period in which it seemed like there might be a negotiated settlement. So Parks and his diplomatic team, you know, were captured later. So this is what the, this is what the edict says. We have never forbidden England and France to trade with China. And for long years, there had been peace between them and us. But three years ago, the English, 
for no good cause, invaded our city of Canton mm -hmm. and carried off our officials into captivity. Yeah. Ye Ming Chen. We refrained at that time from taking any retaliatory measures because we were compelled to recognize the obstinacy of the Viceroy Ye had been in some measure a cause of hostilities. Yeah. Two years ago, the barbarian commander Elgin came north. The barbarian took advantage of our unreadiness, attacking the Taku forts and pressing on to Tianjin. Yeah. Sorry, I just love how they call it barbarian. Yeah, the barbarian. <laughs> and, and then when you get back, obviously they would be called like the lord or the honorable or whatever. Yeah. Well, the treaty hasn't back been signed yet, Trey. Yeah. This is, treaty is the one, as we talked about, that you says cannot call you can't call them barbarians <laughs> anymore. So, you know, the emperor hasn't signed it yet, so yeah. barbarian's still on the menu. Yeah. So, <laughs> being anxious to spare our people the horrors of war, we again refrained from retaliation and ordered Kuchi Liang to discuss terms of peace. So, this is a negotiator. Hmm. Not also, one difficult thing about some of these things is depending on when edicts or things from the Chinese government are translated, the names are all different because the romanization of the names changes throughout the years. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's hard to tell if it's the same person yeah. because it's always written different ways in English. But anyway, the terms of peace. Notwithstanding the outrageous nature of the barbarians' demands, we permitted its, the Treaty of Friendship and Commerce, ratification as earnest of our good faith. Yeah. In spite of all this, Cherry, in spite of all this, <laughs> the barbarian leader, Bruce, again displayed intractability of the most unreasonable kind and once again <laughs> appeared off Taku with a squadron of warships. Yeah. Sengarichen, the Mongol general, mm -hmm. thereupon attacked him fiercely and compelled him to make a hasty retreat. From all these facts, it is clear that China has committed no breach of faith and the barbarians have been in the wrong. During what the present... Well, what, what, what do they do in the British... Uh, uh, chambers when they say I I or yay yay you know <laughs> yeah. when, when they're like making a speech and then everyone agrees you what agree do they with say them? yeah what do what do you say I think the eyes I I, I, I yeah. yeah I'm just gonna say that to your speech you're pounding on the table in agreement yeah. right yeah during this present year the barbarian leaders Elgin and Gross Gross is the French the in charge of the French side have again appeared off our coasts but China unwilling to resort to extreme measures agreed to their landing and permitted them to come to Peking for the ratification of the treaty. They didn't, but, you know, they're kind of just <laughs> after the fact saying we let them land. Yeah. So Because they did land. Yes. <laughs> Whether we let them or not. So <laughs> yeah, let's so just say well that just, we did let yeah. them. <laughs> let's just say that it was allowed. Yeah. Who could have believed that all this time these barbarians had been darkly plotting and that they had brought with them an army of soldiers and artillery with which they attacked the Taku forts from the rear? and having driven out our forces, advanced upon Tianjin. Once more, we ordered our soldiers to go to Tianjin, or we ordered Kuilong to go to Tianjin and endeavor to reason with them in the hope that they might not be lost to all sense of propriety, and with the full <laughs> intention that their demands, if not utterly unreasonable, should be conceded. Mm. To our utter astonishment, <laughs> Elgin and his colleague, probably Parks, had the audacity to demand an indemnity from China, for attacking the ships the previous year. Mm. They asked, too, that more treaty ports should be opened and that they should be allowed to occupy uh, our capital with their army. To such lengths did their brutality and cunning lead them. Mm. And when they say occupy the capital with the army, I think what they mean is like part of the treaty signing is Elgin's like, well, I'm going to need an honor guard mm. to go in there with me, right? You know, like it's going to be like a thousand troops are going to come in to do the, the treaty signing. But they will leave afterwards? Yeah, they'll leave afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. And they're gonna, but they're gonna keep an embassy there and stuff. So it's a little bit. Why does he need a thousand troops? Well, because he probably doesn't want to get captured. But uh. <laughs> I think he wants enough that he can fight his way out if he has to. Right, but I mean, assuming if he didn't have to, and assuming this is gonna be a peaceful, yes, a peaceful a truth signing, yeah, treaty signing, it, it does look. It, does it doesn't seem, look good uh, it, for, uh, for the for the Chinese government. It to, does seem suspicious. Yeah, I mean. You don't let a foreign army march into your capital no. with weapons yeah. if you can prevent it, right? Of course, yeah. Historically, you don't even let your own army march into the capital no. with weapons, right? <laughs> that means a coup is coming. Cherry's been yeah. watching Rome, the HBO Rome yeah. series, and that's like, you know, that's the big thing. You don't let the legions yeah. come, come to Rome no. with their weapons, right? No. We endeavored to induce in them a more reasonable spirit and to come to some satisfactory arrangement. But these treacherous barbarians <laughs> dared to advance their savage soldiery towards Tung Chao and to announce their intention of compelling us to receive them in audience. Mm. 
Any further forbearance on our part would be a dereliction of duty to the empire, so that we have now commanded our armies to attack them with all possible energy, and we have directed the local gentry to organize trained bands, and with them to either join the attack or block the barbarians advance. Hereby we make the offer of the following rewards, and they say like, you know, you get this many tales of silver for killing a white barbarian, this mm. many for killing an Indian soldier, mm. for an officer. There are different prices? There's different prices. You okay. get more for the white soldiers. Oh, so, of course, yeah. So she says, the inhabitants of Tianjin, of Tianjin are reputed brave. Let them now come forward and rid us of these pestilent savages, either by open attack or by artifice. Mm. We are no lovers of war, but all our people must admit that this has been forced upon us. Yeah. The whole, like, gig economy of killing the barbarians. Started then. Well, I mean, it's a, it's been a thing, but mm -hmm. it seems to be a favorite tactic of, of Sushi. Like, that's what happened in the Boxer Uprising. Mm. I, I don't know. Just to kind of like, there's this assumption that if, if she just calls out, then everybody in China is going to rise up and kill these people. Which but, they don't. No, which they don't. So, I mean, it is sort of the illusion, but not we still have nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the ultra nationalism that today that we, you know, obviously is very loud yeah. online. And if you really... Ask people to go out and, and, and... Yeah. People have a lot of complaints about yeah. central government. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously at this time, again, I mean, like the, the Manchus, I mean, they're a... Obviously, it's, it's a complicated situation, but they're a foreign dynasty. Hmm. I mean, they're, they're quite integrated at this point. Yeah. Right? But it's not like, you know, it's not like the people in throughout China, Han or otherwise, had a choice Mm -hmm. and chose the Manchus to be their government. Oh, yeah. It just is, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the building of the new China yeah. in the early 19th, uh, 20th century or, or late 19th century mm -hmm. was very much emphasized on we, are, we need to build a Han nation mm -hmm. rather than this weak, corrupt Qing, yeah. um, Qing nation. But yeah, so, it's no, so, so we're saying it's no surprise that the Han, Lao Bai Xing... Yeah, and it's not uh, just the, Han, the Han, right? I mean, citizens, there's... There's lots of different ethnic groups along the coast and yeah. different areas, right? But yeah, it's that the Lao Bai Xin, the common people, did not actually rise up and... Kill every white person they see. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure a few of them did, but by no yeah. means it's a big... It wasn't... The gig economy plan did not work. No, it did yeah. not work. So she also... Well, the emperor, quote unquote, mm. then goes on to theoretically close all the trading ports and all these other things, mm. which doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the south and stuff, especially because now... Quite a few ports like Shanghai are run by yeah foreigners. They're foreigners. They put on their little Mandarin cap and they go yeah. into the office yeah. and they <laughs> and they run their report and then they send the you know they send the money back to Beijing. So it's yeah. kind of they're not going to close their ports. So no. so then three days later, another edict says we learn that the barbarians continue to press upon our capital. Their demands were all complied with, yet they insist on presenting us in person their barbarous documents of credentials. So even the documents are barbarous, Cherry. <laughs> it's like the documents are like hairy. Yeah. They smell bad. <laughs> you know? Yeah. These are like barbarous documents. So, yeah. so, okay. So all this has one problem, right? Which we already know. Mm -hmm. Everybody experienced in the new. The Qing Empire simply did not have a military force capable of resisting military expeditions of this nature from Europe. Yeah. While the British or French could never have held large portions of China, or perhaps even a single large city, Canton, as we discussed in a previous episode, was kept under Chinese governance. Yeah. They moved quickly, had heavy firepower, and were comparatively quite organized in command and equipment. Yeah. So, like, they, it's not like they can control a Chinese province. They probably can't even control Beijing, you know, which has millions of people in it. But, but they if, can cause a lot of trouble. They can cause a lot of trouble. And if they want to march somewhere... Yeah. You, it's very difficult to stop them. They yeah. carry their own supplies. They move quickly. Yeah. They can burn down. Summer palaces. The summer palace. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's that's enough of a yeah. of a threat and, and, and damage. And just even basic things like you don't necessarily think about as much, but like British and French troops, they're all armed similarly. They're organized. They have units. They're trained. Yeah. You know, you've got 5,000 guys in a line with the same kind of gun. Yeah. Whereas like the, the, the Manchus... The Qing military is still like heavily on the banner system. So you're like, you'll get like 3,000 guys from like Hunan who wear tiger skins. And yeah. they're like, oh, you know, they're like, they can crush rocks with their hands. And yeah. they're like, okay, we'll put them next to, you know, the, the people who like, you know, fight with bamboo sticks. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? It's yeah, like, it's yeah. all very yeah. hodgepodge. Yeah. And <laughs> I got that one playing uh, the Three Kingdoms. No, exactly. It's, 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 and, and 
I mean, Three Kingdoms much, much uh, uh, earlier. Earlier, but it's, it hasn't changed Total all War, that Three much. Three Kingdoms. She's yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the video game. Yeah. yeah. But it hasn't changed that much, is what we're saying. Yeah. All the units have their special abilities, but they're not well organized as a con- cohesive unit, modern uh, military. Modern military. So you have all these different people show up from different regions, which is the same thing that happened in the Opium War around Canton. And, you know, sometimes they don't even speak the same language. Yeah. You have other issues like Beijing is supposed to have a garrison. I forget the number, but like 20,000 or 30,000 mm. crack cavalry troops that are like Manchu and Mongol troops that are just that are just there just to guard the capital. Yeah. But this is now decades, hundreds of years later, and people realize at a certain point, well, we only line up to prove that we're here and get paid like a couple times a year. So it's easier to just rent a horse right. and show up, <laughs> right, with the horse on the day. Right. Right. To Rather put the, than paying for the maintenance and yes, training right, and the training whole regiment and all this stuff. Throughout every day of the year but it's been like that so long that Mm -hmm. apparently sengarichin knows that that's what's happening Mm -hmm. so he's like everybody it's horse inspection day and everybody rents a horse and then he just marches them off (laughs) (laughs) like that day yeah so they can't give the horses back right and then he makes them like fight a battle and they don't do very well but like you know like it's it's, something yeah but it's so like everybody knows this is what's happening yeah much like today pretending so the court either didn't know this or they were willfully ignorant there were advisors who were more experienced with the barbarians who attempted to tell them, who'd seen them in Canton, you know, or who, who had seen them fight in battles. Um, some of the people who are now part of the negotiation were from Canton mm-hmm. and that they, they brought up there to like get more expertise. But the emperor and the court are convinced, no, no, if we really put our weight behind it, we could just crush them. Mm-hmm. There's only like, you know, 20,000 of the guys, right? Yeah. So the first a serious attempt to meet the allies in a fixed battle happens outside of Tianjin the same day as Parks and Friends were captured, September 18th. Some 30,000 to 50,000 Qing, mainly infantry and artillery, attempted to stop them from coming up the road mm-hmm. past Tianjin. Um, it was 30 called, to 50,000, that's a lot. It's, well, it's a lot by European standards. Right. In the Taiping Civil War, Zheng Guofan is down there in southern China, and there's battles of... 300,000 on a side mm. the siege of Beijing or the siege of Nanjing has like half a million people on each side mm. so it's but this is you know what you know this is those are armies that are built up over years mm. right in months this is like the British land and a month later they're at Beijing so you you know what I mean like you, you don't have a lot of time right you gotta just grab grab everybody whoever you can and throw them in the path of them yeah so this is called the Battle of Zhongjiwan, and they're eventually overrun by the British and French vanguard. The British and French say that, like, you know, that the, the Qing fought very bravely, but they just, our guns are better. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They're not very organized. We just punched through them. Yeah. And the rest of them ran away. So. Which is believable. So three days later, there's another battle, what's called the Eight Mile Bridge, uh, closer towards Beijing. It's the Balikao Zhijian. Battle of the Eight Mile Bridge, where there was another... Oh, Bali Chao. Bali Chao. Okay. Yeah. Zhijian. <laughs> What's Zhijian? I don't know. <laughs> so like, anyway. Is that the city? No, it's the... Uh, I think it's... Oh, Zhijian. I think it's battle. The battle. Yeah, the battle the, of Bali Chao. Yeah, there okay. we go. <laughs> We're doing translation work here, Cherry. Another large Qing army attempted to hold the allied forces and prevent them from crossing the bridge. Mm. Again, good tactics. This is what you do. You know, use a choke point, try and stop them from getting across the bridge. Mm. They couldn't stop them from getting across the bridge. So, sorry, good tactics, but didn't work. Didn't work. Okay. And there's this there's this thing which comes up in the Opium War. It comes up in um, this war too. Mm. Of like, well, yeah, they have better guns. But if we just get up close enough to them, right? Because then we'll, we know martial arts. We have swords. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll just stab them to death. And it's not really how it works. It, it didn't work. Uh-huh. Um, and Singarichans, all his Mongol cavalry, who are like the best troops they have, mm-hmm. they all get killed. Yeah. More or less. So now there's nothing. Right now, basically, there is no more Qing army around Beijing. It's basically disintegrated. So panic now. Most of the court immediately fled, uh, as, as did the rich and influential in the capital itself. Yeah. Ironically, you know what they fled behind for protection? Left, fled behind? Yeah. The Great Wall. Oh. Uh, so they got to go to the so, other side of the Great so Wall. So they're now. retreating to the, I guess, the... the Manchu type The land. Manchu. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the home of, yeah. So behind, they're going beyond the Great Wall now. Yeah, they're getting the barbarians. The real barbarians are chased yeah. out, of, <laughs> the out, new of, bar- out of the occupied land by the new barbarians. So this was not Canton. Mm-hmm. 
Canton was, I think, relatively calm when it got captured. No one here had any real experience with foreigners. So they have no idea what these people are going to do. No. So everybody just panics and uh, tries to get out of the city. So this is a diary written in Beijing mm -hmm. by a scholar of the Hanlin Academy, which is... Oh, yeah. Hanlin Shu Yuan. Which is, you know, kind of like, I don't know, it's, it's half like the best university in China. And it's also like half a think tank. Yeah. Um, of where policy gets developed. Isn't it? Yeah. Confucian policy. Yeah. It's odd that the, the, it's the barbarians that are at court. It's the Manchurians that are court. Yeah. But they still have all these Confucianist yeah. stuff. He's trapped in the city, this doctor of the Hanlin Academy, or scholar of the Hanlin Academy, mm -hmm. because his mother is dying of dysentery, and he has to prepare her coffin and funeral garments. Oh. He also has different doctors telling him different things, and he doesn't know what to believe. Okay. So it's a, it's a diary of partially his personal tragedy of his mother dying and him preparing her coffin and the funeral and all that. And he says, alas, the ancients have rightly said that a good son should know something of the principles of medicine. And surely my ignorance has been the first cause of my mother's death. Though I should give up my life a hundred times, how can I ever atone for this? I don't know if, a, if the requirement of a good son is to well, know medicine. Sure. Are you a Confucian <laughs> expert? Have you, gone to the, have you gone to the Hanlin Academy? That's, that's a good point. Have you passed well, the imperial? Women aren't allowed to do any of those no. things. Have you so. passed the imperial civil service exam? I wouldn't be allowed to no. attend. So why don't you keep your opinions to yourself? Okay. <laughs> okay. These amateur opinions about what a Confucian gentleman should know. So... Uh, <laughs> The account, of pro the account progresses, first with rumors the barbarians have taken the Taku forts, then confirmation of the defeat. It says, during the next few days, people began to leave Peking. For the, report was, for the report was spread that our troops had been defeated at Taku and that a brigadier general was among the slain. Mm. The garrison had fled and the forts were in the hands of the barbarian. Right. So not looking good. Yes. The following day, his friend, Magistrate Li Min, uh, Li Min Chai, looked in to say goodbye. He was leaving to join the troops in Anhui. Uh, he expressed strong disapproval of somebody else's prescription and gave him a new prescription. Mm. So, you know, to different people. So, you know, you're a doctor, you're giving out medical advice, and you're also going to go fight a battle. Mm. That's the, that's how, that's Multi -talented why Multi-talented. That's why the Chinese government system is officials. better, Cherry. Yeah. <laughs> you're good at everything. We don't need experts. No. Every Confucius, Confucius scholar, every achieved Confucius scholar is... is Yes. Is an expert, expert of everything. everything. Yeah. You know, he starts construction of the coffin. So a week later, while they're lacquering the coffin, he says, On that day, our troops carried the barbarian leader, Pa Shi, La, pa Shi Li Parks, okay. <laughs> together with eight others who were imprisoned at the Board of Punishment. Together, the whole, thereupon the whole city was in an uproar, and it became known that his majesty was preparing to leave on a tour northwards. Hmm. But the concubine Yi, so she, persuaded some of the older officials to urge him to remain. None of these memorials have been published. All the Manchu and Chinese officials were now sending their families away and their valuables, but the large shops outside the main gate were doing business as usual. Mm. Ten days later, our troops engaged the barbarians outside the Chihua gate. The van was, the van is like the vanguard, was composed of untrained Mongol cavalry who had never been in action. No sooner had the barbarians opened fire than they turned as one man, broke their ranks, and stampeded upon the infantry in the rear. Many were trampled to death, and a general rout followed, our men fleeing in every direction, and the barbarian pressing on the city walls. Another decree was put out by the concubine Yi, mm. offering large rewards to any who should slay the barbarians. Early the next morning, we heard the news of another engagement outside the Chiho Gate, upon which news his sacred majesty, attended by all his concubines, the princes, ministers, and dukes, and all the officers of the household, left the city in a desperate rout and disorder unspeakable, hmm. affording a spectacle that gave the impression that hordes of barbarians were already in close pursuit. At a ma as a matter of fact, the foreigners were still at a considerable distance and at the Summer Palace. There was nothing whatsoever to cause the slightest apprehension. I cannot understand why His Majesty was allowed to leave. Up to the very last, the Yi concubine begged him to remain in his palace, as his presence there could not fail to awe the barbarians and thus to exercise a protecting influence for the good of the city and the people. She begged him to bear in mind that in the Zhou dynasty, when the son of heaven fled his capital, his head covered in dust, and was forced to take refuge with one of his feudal princes, the Chinese people have always regarded this as a humiliating event in the history of our country. Hmm. But the present flight of the court appears more humiliating still. Mm. <laughs> one thing you'll notice about all these accounts... Yeah. The emperor has very little agency. Yeah. Because the emperor is basically, he's 30 years old. He's a drug addict. Yeah. 
And how could we allow the emperor to yeah to leave? Basically, right? he was saying. Yeah, it's like he's a cat. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right? It's it's just a very symbolic cat. Yeah, but it's just all the people around the cat control what the cat does. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, but it's, he's a puppet. Exactly. Eventually, I mean, it's can I? This is yeah. this is not the similar. This is. It just reminds me like there's this bit. Maybe it's a joke, but I think there's some truth to it. Like an emperor has all these concubines yeah. right you got to produce as many heirs as you could yeah and then uh, you know there's all these historical drama of like oh the emperor really loves this one concubine the, yeah. the most or the queen the most but every night he's forced to choose a different to flip a different plate to yeah. go sleep with a different concubine because yeah. he needs to he needs to do his duty yeah he's you know? got to lie back and think of china <laughs> exactly yeah yeah so the job obviously obviously it's a sweet job but also <laughs> it's uh it comes with a uh, you know the 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 court the Chinese system the court has significant power oh yeah and and influence um, yeah it's and not just it's it's not just a one person rule sort of a thing I think the yeah. best the best time to be an emperor mm -hmm. is you've either you're the first emperor of a new dynasty yeah so you you go in there yeah you still you still know all the generals you have all this power outside the court yeah you have you know your family that helped you get to be the emperor yeah all this influence or maybe that guy's son. But once you're like a few generations in, 200 years in, yeah, you have no allies. You're just a yeah. child who's grown up in the Forbidden City. Yeah, yeah, and there's going to be several different power power camps that are oh. at odds with each other all the and time. You're and you're just the person on a seat. Yeah, essentially. But much like the emperor at this. Much time. Much like the emperor at this time. The previous emperors, like uh, Dao Gong Emperor and Kongxi Emperor, mm. much more agency and. You know what China's doing. Sushi much more. more oh yeah, agency. Sushi. Well, because she basically <laughs> stages a coup and takes yeah. over the government. So yeah. yeah so, sushi. so she is the first emperor, oh, really, kind of a new of dynasty. Her, yeah. Of Sushi dynasty. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So his mother dies eventually. Empress, sorry, Sushi Empress. Empress, Empress yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, at "11 p.m. She passed away, abandoning her most undutiful son. Alas, there is no doubt that her death lies at my door because of my ignorance of medicine, smiting my body against the ground. I invoke heaven." But a thousand separate deaths, but ten thousand separate deaths, excuse me, could not atone me for my sins. It seems like a little bit self-involved. If yeah. my my <laughs> Well, you know. You yeah. gotta really show your grief. Yeah. Okay. So now he's worried because his mother dies. Uh-huh. He's he's got this fancy coffin. He's put all these silk and fancy clothes on her. Sure. To bury her. What's there to worry about? What if the barbarians come in and dig up her coffin? Oh. Because they think somebody buried valuable somewhere. Which is likely. Yeah. Well, I don't so, know. Is it likely to dig grave? Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's it's within characters of of the of the. I mean, you got to remember this, this is this is this is the, this is the point in time where British are kicking open doors and pyramids and just grabbing bodies out and stuff and being like, "Oh, cool, what's this?" Mm. Um, so, <laughs> so he says, it, "It was impossible for me to consider calmly what might happen if they were to find and desecrate my mother's coffin. Mm. I remembered what had been told of their doings in Canton under similar circumstances. Mm. So these barbarians have a reputation, Jerry. Right." So we, his worries are not unfounded. No. Taking her around the city. Eventually, he's going to bury her outside the city. Mm. He doesn't think that the person who's going to carry the, her, they have enough people holding her. And they're like, she's, she's going to get bumped around too much. And he, Anyway, it's a whole big thing. Okay. But eventually, that's solved. And she's out of there. Okay. He's, he's still in the city. A week later, a little after midday, an immense blaze was seen in the northwest. And speedily, it was reported that the barbarians had seized the summer palace. Our army is said to number half a million men. Yet it seems that not one of them dare to oppose the barbarians. Advance. Mm. They have about a thousand cavalry, yet they move about at will in our midst as if in an uninhabited wilderness. Tis strange. <laughs> is it though? Is it strange though? No. Yeah. Uh, on the afternoon of the 24th, vast columns of smoke were seen rising in the northwest and it was ascertained that the barbarians had entered the summer palace. Mm. And after plundering the three main halls, leaving them absolutely bare, they had set fire to the buildings. Mm. Their excuse for this abdominal behavior is that their troops got out of hand and had committed the incendiarism. After this, they issued notices, placarded everywhere in very bad Chinese, <laughs> stating that unless terms of peace had been arranged before midday, they would then bombard Peking, in which case all inhabitants who did not wish to share the fate of the city had better remove themselves to a safe distance. Mm. And when they say unless peace had been arranged, they also mean you return the people you captured from yeah, us. Yeah, I'm sure. A few days later, the barbarians entered the city by the Anting Gate, occupying its tower and the wall adjoining. One large cannon and four small ones were placed in position on the wall. 
and a five-colored flag ho hoisted there. With the exception of the officials entrusted with the duty of negotiating, not one remained in the city. Two days ago, the prisoner Parks and his companions were sent back to the enemy with every mark of courtesy. Scarcely had they reached their camp when a special decree, post haste from Jehol, which is the court of the mm -hmm. Manchurians past the wall, ordered Prince Kung, who's the guy who's handling the negotiation, to decapitate them. All forthwith as a special warning to the bandits who dared to invade the sacred precincts of the palace. Mm. So at the same time, this guy, Yi Xin, sometimes translated as Prince Gong, sometimes translated as Prince Kong. He's trying to negotiate peace. You have Su Shi and the emperor just writing these crazy letters of like, just kill them all. Yeah. And he just kind of has to ignore them. Yeah. The barbarians were now in full possession of the city and rumors were rife on all sides. Everyone in Peking, there were still a good many people, was terrified. Hmm. Of course. The condition of the people was indeed deplorable in the extreme. One of the censors had sent a memorial to Jehol, reproaching the emperor for the past to which he had brought his people and for the neglect of ancestral worship caused by his absence. He blamed his majesty for listening to evil advisors, besought for him to return to his capital. The minds of the people were becoming more than ever disturbed because it was now reported that negotiations for peace had so far failed, mm. either because Prince Gong would not entertain the barbarians' conditions or because the latter were too utterly preposterous. Mm. On the 6th, a dispatch arrived from the barbarians, accusing China of having violated all civilized usage in torturing to death their fellow countrymen. Mm. This is the people who were killed in captivity. Yeah. For this, they demand an indemnity of 500,000 taels of silver. So there's a, bit in, there's a bit of back and forth because the Russian embassy in Beijing has, in, has been in Beijing for centuries mm -hmm. because unlike the rest, Russia shares a land border. Yeah. Russia's had special permission to be there. They have to wear Chinese clothes, but they're on the old rules of how you deal with the empire. Okay. But so, how, how do they, what, what role do they play here? Well, they sense the ability to maybe get a deal in. Mm. And so they're like, they're like, um, we can try and cut a deal with the British and get them to lower the amount of money. Yeah. Maybe you owe us a favor. <laughs> Prince Gong's like, no, because he doesn't want to owe the Russians a favor. Right. Probably smart. But then they get one anyway, because... Russia then says, we won't intervene on your behalf. But we already did because they were going to charge you $2 million, and we got them to take it down a little bit. <laughs> so you really do our, you already owe us a favor. It, so, was a, it was a favor forced upon yes. China. Yep. Reaching the end of his account. He says, the whole 16 articles of the barbarians' demands have finally been accepted without modification. The only thing our negotiators asked was the immediate withdrawal of the invading army. And to obtain this, they were prepared to yield everything. Hmm. Therefore, the barbarians openly flout China for her lack of men. Woe is me, a pitiful tale and one hard to tell. When the Yi concubine heard of Prince Gong's complete surrender to the barbarians, she reproached the emperor for allowing his brother to negotiate, and she implored him to reopen hostilities. But his majesty was dangerously ill and refused to leave Jehol, so that our revenge must be postponed for the time being. This feeling that he has of like, how could our country be so weak? Mm. We're so big. We have so many people. Yeah. How could these 10,000 barbarians yeah. march to our capital yeah. and do this to us? Like, what, you know, like, where is everybody? Yeah. You know, that is the exact same. We were talking about this earlier, actually, outside the podcast. Like, that's the exact same mentality that is sort of the social bargain that the modern Chinese mm. government yeah. has made with the people mm -hmm. of like, we need to be strong. You know, you have to make sacrifices so that this sort of thing can't happen again. Yeah. Yeah, sure. There's some there's some liberties and some things that you might not get. Yeah. But in return... You get a strong court. You get a strong court. Therefore, a strong country. That will never bow. To and a strong barbarians. military. Yeah, that will never bow to the barbarians. Yeah. And never let this happen. Yeah. Beijing um, must be strong. No, exactly, yeah. right? So this is not it's, a... It's one country. <laughs> also, like, also sort of like, yeah, we got to bind together. Yes. And there can't be any divisions yeah. between different groups of people. Yeah. We all need to be one forcefully. <laughs> this is a a cry mm -hmm. that is going to be continue on throughout the century of shame, quote unquote, but mm -hmm. also is gonna is still alive and well, I think, in modern. Yeah, and we're we're not saying that this feeling is not genuine. No, no, I think he's it's he, he probably was genuine, yeah. right? But not, whether 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 his views were cr uh, right or wrong, yeah, that feeling was. Very much shared universally by a lot of people, Chinese yeah. people. But where yeah. I think he's wrong, mm -hmm. and which is, and also is what's going to happen with China, is that what they decide is the answer. And I think what they decide is the answer even today mm -hmm. is that you need to be authoritarian 
but just have a strong military. Yeah. And this is where China's going to modernize at the time. Yeah. And I, 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 when you say what well, they decided to be the answer, yeah. I, I do think, uh, again, arguing on the basis that the, the feelings are genuine by the people oh, or yeah. government officials like that, like him. Uh, I, I don't know if the decision was reached based on how do we make China better. I think the decision was reached on ba- based on how do we keep power. Not, it's not. It's less about yeah, the true. country. It's more about we're well, asking on power. I think, that's true. I think yeah. that's true today of the People's Republic of China as well. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm yeah. saying. That the, the reason today is based on that. Yes. I mean, or maybe they really think they're the, the they have the mandate of the heaven and yeah. there must be the, <laughs> if there will be no CCP, there will be no more China. Yeah. So you know. Anyways, my point. Yeah. So 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 you're saying there is a. There's not a real lineage, but like there is it, th- this sort of thinking. Yeah. And uh, it's not new at this period, right? Yeah. I mean, there's people at the end of the Ming dynasty, mm. 300 years later of like, yeah. how are the Manchus here? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what happened? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not a new thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So back to Elgin, right? So mm. the city, everybody's panicked. Nobody knows what's going to happen. The military can't stop them. They're now basically at the kind of the mercy of these foreigners. Yeah. Even though there's not that many of them. Yi Xin, Prince Kong, or Pr- Prince Gong, was left in charge of negotiations. Okay. He's the half brother, though the emperor has a lot of half brothers, so that's not saying <laughs> sure, much. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Anybody who came from a concubine yeah. is a half brother. Everyone's a half brother, yeah. He's Sometimes half- there are too many of them, you gotta kill a few. Yeah, otherwise you have a civil war. Yeah. Um, he's sort of like the only adult left in the room. Okay. He looks at the situation and he realizes. We can't beat these people. Right. Right. Like we just, we can't beat them. We have to come to something Mm. and then we have to figure out what to do next. But as long as they're here, it's like an open wound. Yeah. We have to get rid of them. So he first negotiates an armistice with Elgin. He agrees to all the points Mm -hmm. of the negotiation. However, there's an issue. We talked about in the previous episode when they return the prisoners, about half of them are dead. Mm. And despite kind of trying to cover it up, they died in some pretty brutal ways. Mm. Now there's a new crisis. Because Elgin and the Allies, because obviously this gets reported, he's going to go back to England. You can't just be like, they killed all of our embassies and then we just signed the treaty. Yeah. Right? They have to now, now the British have to make a statement yeah. about this. One of the first thoughts, Elgin and, and crew, was let's burn down the Forbidden Palace. Mm. Let's go in there and burn it down. Or loot the city. Sack the city. However, this was abandoned because it would make ratifying the treaty difficult. Again, you want someone you, to negotiate with them yeah. when, and the Forbidden Palace being the government. <laughs> yes. It's not a museum. It's like the White House. Yeah, or, it's not yeah. just a museum at this point. It's not just the, because it's also like, it's everything, right? It's the court. Oh, it's, no, yeah. It's, you know, there's all these other. It's the office. It's the court. It's where everyone lives. It's where, where everyone at court works. It's the bureaucracy, right? Yeah. It's, it's all that. It's so, the institution. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, it's like the Buckingham Palace when, when I guess England did have. Yeah. When everything did operate out of there. When <laughs> well, there was no con- yeah. What? Well, I mean, there's always, there's parliament and stuff, but. I thought that's a relatively new. It's like 500 years old. That's, that's new. <laughs> <laughs> I guess from a Chinese perspective. Generally. Yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, yeah. Agreed. You're the, long thinking people. Yeah. The Summer Palace is on the other hand. Yeah. It's just a garden. It's just a garden. <laughs> of Tsushi. So this is what Locke said, Elgin's secretary, who had gotten captured previously. He said, it was felt that no monetary indemnity could compensate for the insult afflicted. Mm. And moreover, if an indemnity had been enforced, it would have fallen on the people and not on the emperor, mandarin classes. Remember when he says, we shouldn't ask for money because they are going to ask for money also, as mm. well as burning the summer <laughs> palace. But yeah. it was desirable in consequence of the early withdrawal of the armies rendered necessary by the advance of winter to mark in some way which would place it beyond all dispute that the allies had occupied Beijing as conquerors. Mm. Otherwise, the imperial government would deny the fact and assert that the allies had been forced to retire by the imperial army. Mm. So they go, if we burn down the summer palace, they can't cover it up. Mm. It was there. Now it's not there. Yeah, it is. So it's very symbolic. Yes. Yeah. Um, It may be urged that it was a ruthless act to destroy so much that was rare, beautiful and valuable. But wonderful as was the extent of the palace or more correctly speaking, palace and gardens for for there were an estimated upwards of 200 buildings and the ground covered an area of either by 10 miles extent, still there was no utter annihilation of art or learning. For on good authority it was stated that nothing unique either in the shape of book, manuscripts, or art was kept at Yan Ming Yan, Summer Palace, and in the subsequent search for both, previous to the burning, very few were found, and certainly none of exclusive rarity. Is that true? 
No, it's not true. Okay, it's, yeah, because I was... It's not true, Cherry. It's clearly not true. Yeah. And also he says, in the subsequent search previous to the burning, a.k.a. we looted the entire place, like, to, like, chipping out the gold, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. inlays in the floorboards. Yeah. Like, oh, we didn't find anything in our search of the place you know we wanted to make sure there was nothing yeah rare there so they've looted everything valuable first and they, they go, have oh looted. there's nothing in there yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, go, go look at it yeah it's just there's like some, it's all abandoned there's and, just some and, buildings and stuff yeah yeah so okay. so at least part of my chinese education was accurate then. no because you know, i mean was basically like a very you could think of it as an as a museum really yeah uh, obviously only enjoyed by the by the very privileged few yeah and the court and sushi but it's it's like if you burn down Buckingham Palace, as you said, like, obviously... There's all sorts of artifacts and yeah. arts and books and, yeah. you know, yeah. History it's, there. St- stuff of a cultural and historical importance there. Yes. For the country, yeah. So this is 100% trying to put a good spin on it. Yeah. Okay. So he also well, good. Sl- now I can sleep. Yeah, now I can sleep, sleep at night knowing that the atrocity of the Summer Palace... <laughs> that the British ...was indeed an atrocity. <laughs> or actually the bad guys. <laughs> yeah. So he also yeah. says... Yeah. The money found in the treasury was of no great amount. It was taken possession of by the price agents, by the prize agents, for distribution among the troops. And all officers and men who had taken any property previous to the 18th from Yan Ming Yan had to hand it over to the officers appointed to receive the same. It was all subsequently sold at public auction, the proceeds going to the general fund for distribution to the army. Not true. But, mm-hmm. you know, they did say you're supposed to hand all your loot, but most people didn't. Mm. But it was to hand it in so we could sell it mm. you know so yeah they took everything that was not nailed down this is how it's described by the new york times when i was looking up for how it was described you forget it's easy to forget that like things move slower back then so this happened in october mm-hmm. in early in like mid-october and you don't get reports in the new york times of the burning until like january of the next year <laughs> three months and they're later. like the yeah. latest news from canton on steamship like you yeah. know what i mean yeah, like yeah. so it has to get all the way across the ocean and then somebody's got to beep beep, beep 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 to the new york times yeah on a telegraph so anyway this is how the new york times describes it uh-huh. indiscriminate looting has been allowed the public reception hall the state and private bedrooms anterooms borders and every other apartment has been ransacked Articles of value of native and foreign workmanship taken or broken if too large to be carried away. Mm. Ornamental latticework, screens, jade stone ornaments, jars, clocks, watches, and other piece of, pieces of mechanism, curtains and furniture. None have escaped destruction. He's also talking about how they're looting so much silk and garments from it that they just started using silk-like gowns as ropes to tie up the other silk oh my god like, you know what i mean like to tie down the wagons of like loot they're just like tying like like silk yeah. sheets together to make ropes yeah so the, the new york times is very critical very critical of it well america at this point is standing on the moral high ground well we're also I fighting guess. a war against slavery yeah so you true. know well in china you're standing on the moral high <laughs> ground the moral not high elsewhere ground. not not like yeah. domestically speaking well interestingly so there's another article uh-huh. that talks about how like Oh, the British and French looted the place as they do when they take a city. Like those barbar, those barbarous Europeans. Like mm. they're still looting cities. You know, like they're like, like the Goths or the Vandals sacking Rome, which they were. Which they were. Yeah. And they also go like supposedly they claim this New York Times article that the British say that they've gained back all the money they spent on the expedition by looting the Summer Palace and through the the, the money they got through the indemnities. The Summer Palace. Yeah. Yeah. And the Americans in the, in the New York Times articles like, we don't believe that because mm. it's very expensive to move an army around. Mm. But even if it's true, it still shows that we as the Americans made the right decision mm. to just sign the thing because <laughs> we didn't have to do any of this yeah. and spend any money. Mm. And yet we still now we're all in the same position. Never forget to earn points. This is another account from somebody who's going to become quite important in the time period from Charles, quote unquote, Chinese Gordon. Huh? who's later going to lead um, the Ever Victorious Army, which is a Qing army that's led by British officers and is going to be quite influential in the Taiping It's uprising. called the Ever Victorious? The Ever Victorious <laughs> Army. Okay. Got to do an episode on that. Yeah, we should, but led by Chinese Gordon. Okay. So he's present at the burning of the Summer Palace. Yeah. He's just a regular British officer at this point. Well, why is he Chinese Gordon? Because he was that's a nickname? Chinese general. Yeah, so he okay. was, they called him Chinese Gordon. Okay. Because he like, you know, had all these awards from the emperor and sushi and stuff. And sure. Okay. But now, right now, he's just Charles Gordon. He's not Chinese Gordon yet. <laughs> so he said the Chinese had 
then until the 23rd to think over the terms of our treaty and pay 10,000 pounds for each Englishman and 500 pounds for each native soldier who had died in captivity. Hmm. So, so like, yeah, you know, one, one 20th for the poor Sikh soldiers who got killed. He Quite said, a difference. Yeah, I know. So, he's, you know what? Though, for when, when Sushi and the emperor put out the bounty on heads, the, the white heads were only worth twice as much. Oh. So, really, if you think about it, mm. Chinese are more egalitarian Egal- people. <laughs> so, he said, the Chinese had terms to think of a treaty. This they did. They paid the money, which... You know, Locke is like, we could never ask for money for mm. what happened. Well, they did ask for <laughs> money and the Chinese yeah. paid it. Yeah. This they did and the money was paid and the treaty signed yesterday. I could not witness it as all the officers commanding companies were obliged to remain in camp. Owing to the ill treatment the prisoners experienced at the Summer Palace, the general ordered it to be destroyed and stuck up pro- proclamations to say why it was ordered in Chinese. Oh, because their soldiers were tortured? Yeah, that's what they're saying. Okay. Because, you know, you treated our, this is why we're burning the Summer Palace. Right. They can't just torture some Chin soldiers? Is that? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, we accordingly went out, and after pillaging it, burned the whole place, destroying in a vandal-like manner most valuable property, which could not be replaced for $4 million. We got upwards of £48 pounds a piece prize money before we went out of here. And although I have not as much as many, I have done well. The I'm people sure. Are, <laughs> the people are civil, but I think the grandees, like the mandarins, hate us as they must, as they must after what we did to the palace. You can scarcely imagine the beauty and magnificence of the palaces we burn. It made one's heart sore to burn them. In fact, these palaces were so large and we were so pressed for time that we could not plunder them carefully. Quantities of gold ornaments were burned, considered as brass. It was wretched, wretchedly demoralizing work for an army. Everyone was wild for plunder. So the thing he's really upset about. Yeah. He's like, oh, it was beautiful. We burned it. But he's also like, we really could have gotten more, more, looting, out of it, more yeah. looting in there. We didn't, we didn't do a thorough job I know. Of, of robbing, <laughs> of, of chipping away the gold or, yeah. or recognizing which one's grass and which one's gold so yeah. we can grab them. Yeah. So really, we did a crappy job of it. When he said demoralizing, yeah. which part is demoralizing? That they didn't loot enough or that they destroy something of such beauty? I elegance? think it's a little bit of both. Okay. But I think also, yeah, he's annoyed that they could have gotten a lot more. Yeah. You know, I don't know if it's true. That's demoralizing. I'm sure that that to destroy the the the, the summer palace. I'm sure everyone's very happy about the gold they're they're receiving. Yeah. yeah. I think they probably would have preferred to just finish chipping all the gold out of the floor tiles and then just leave it, leave all the gardens and the lakes and mm, stuff. Yeah. So my. But they have to uh, make a make a make a point. Well, my after reading all the accounts, my pet theory now is they took the summer palace. Yeah. And they described they could not stop the troops from looting. The, the <laughs> troops just immediately started looting it. Yeah. And because there's British and French troops, each side was like, well, they're going to loot it first. Right. Mm-hmm. If the British tell their troops to stop and the French troops are looting it. They're going to get it all. So it just became a madhouse. Yeah. And as this is described in like the letters from that Hanlin doctor or Hanlin scholar, they saw burning from the palace like way before the supposed burning of the summer palace. Mm. So I think sort of... They just looted the thing, and I think it partially is a cover-up. I think they're it's like, likely, yeah. we look really bad if we just go in here, and we're here to theoretically sign a treaty, and we just just loot random stuff that has nothing to do with it. Yeah. You know, we look pretty bad. Yeah. But if we say, oh, no, it was a symbol. It was for British honor. Right. Then it is a little bit more defensible. When the average soldier would just like... Doesn't care. Just doesn't give loot. a... Yeah. Yeah. So... It's an opportunity to, yeah, get rich. So that's my that's my theory. It's a cover up. Yeah. Summer Palace looting cover up. I think that's more likely than the carefully organized. Yeah. Show of point. Retribution. Yeah. In the end, though, it's all pointless because the British and French don't get their treaty signed by the emperor because <laughs> the emperor is behind the Great Wall. <laughs> and yeah. He's not coming back. No. <laughs> so you know. He's probably doing <clears throat> drugs behind the wall. And... He's doing almost certainly doing drugs behind the wall. Yeah. You know what? They just get it to be signed by. Prince Kong, Yu Xin, the guy which who is did, a government official, and you, that which is basically yeah. the same they would have gotten otherwise. Yeah. They got him to sign it outside the Forbidden City mm-hmm. um, in the Ministry of Rights in October twenty fourth, eighteen sixty. This is basically the exact same treaty that was decided in eighteen fifty eight. Mm. That was stopped in eighteen fifty nine. It's got a couple of new things. The British get Kowloon. Um, there's yeah. there's some more ports open and kind of stuff, but mm-hmm. it's, it's basically the same treaty. Yeah. Um, also, parts of Korea were given to Russia, and they don't tell Korea. <laughs> Korea's gonna. I was find just it. like, 
that's ours to <clears throat> give away no but yeah. <laughs> korea is gonna find out later right which they're gonna enjoy not yeah with the british french russian and eventually american ambassadors present in beijing this would mark an end to the arm's length diplomacy that had marked euro sino relations for centuries mm. for better or worse china was now essentially open to foreign traders foreign missionaries and foreign ideas mm. On the one hand, this would bring huge societal upheaval and great changes economically and culturally. While the Opium War had cracked the door into China, the aftermath of the Arrow War would slam it wide open. Yeah. A position it would remain in until 1949. Mm. Also, <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I mean, for better or worse, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. Mao did close the door. And that's why I think it's very, none of this has to do with Opium, really. The yeah, second well, opium. When you say for better or for worse, I feel like at the later part of the first half of the 20th century i don't i don't think it's the same as the aid uh aid alliance aid country alliance marching into beijing i don't know or, or, or this looting i, I think no. it was a different nature i know <laughs> what the foreigners were doing in china well japan yeah. was a foreigner in china so that's true yeah i forgot about them yeah and well you know japan what? was defeated before 1949 you know, Cherry, if it hadn't yeah. been for mao who would have been next after japan could have been could have been somebody else marching into china ah uh. thankfully though he made China stand up. Yeah. And then it was Red Guards marching in China. So. <laughs> At least it's our own people, yeah. I guess. It's your own people looting the palaces. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. So true. And burning them. Yeah. On the other hand, though, signing this treaty mm -hmm. is actually going to be good for the Qing dynasty because they now have access to buy Western weapons, mm. Western trainers, Western ships, Western personnel, and access to Western financial markets. They can quote unquote modernize. Yes. Which is gonna, which they're gonna use to put an end to the long-running rebellions, such as the Taiping, yeah, Nian Rebellion, and in, in other parts of China, mm -hmm. and they're gonna essentially pacify the country. Mm. For the court's part, though, within the year, the emperor would be dead. Sushi will have staged a coup mm. and seize power over the Qing state. Her energetic leadership, though often flawed, mm. would lead to a resurgence of state power over the next few decades. Mm. Topic we will likely discuss in future episodes. But to those who have listened on this topic. Since my first episodes on it last year, which was the McCartney expedition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let me have you, let me leave you with a little something to tie all this together. Mm. While they're looting and destroying the Summer Palace, searching for valuables, the looting soldiers came upon something strange. One of the buildings was full of antique British items. A stagecoach, <laughs> clocks, cannons, telescopes, yeah. Yeah. textiles, and other valuables. Let me guess. When <laughs> they were all perfectly preserved. <laughs> yeah. And after some investigation, they were found to be... From the McCartney yes. expedition. They were the tribute brought by Lord McCartney to the Qinlong Emperor in 1793, yeah. almost 70 years earlier, mm. in the hope of opening up... China. China. Greater relations with China. And many I don't of know if it's great relations with China. What's a greater? Like a greater in, in, relations. In, yeah. not, in, not better. Broader. Broader. Yeah. And we talked about that episode. The things they wanted... You know, they wanted missionaries to be able to travel through China. They mm -hmm. wanted open ports. They wanted an embassy in Beijing. They tried it, you know, with honey. Mm. And now they didn't get it. And now 70 years later, the guns have come out. You mean carrot and stick? Yeah, carrot now and it's the stick. Now it's the stick. Yeah. The guns have come out and mm. now they're getting it by force. Yeah. And leaving a Crater unforgettable behind. mark on mm -hmm. Chinese, on this, I don't know, in the, in the history of China. Which is still has which still has its influence today. Some of Elgin's logic makes sense. You go, yeah, okay, it's a summer palace. Normal people, normal Chinese people can't go there. It's just a playground for rich people. Yeah, it's got all this art or whatever, and that's true. Right at the time period, right? Yeah, it, burn down the Packingham Palace to see I, how I, how the British I, public I, feel. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. They probably feel strong more strongly than. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, obviously, at the time, <laughs> yeah, that's true to an extent. But what they've done now is they've robbed the Chinese people. Yeah. By of, destroying of the, this. Of the, of the ability now to enjoy this part of their history and, yeah. their, and their heritage yeah. 150 years later. I mean, by burning it, they almost made it more of a cultural symbol. So now I think if we ever go to Beijing, I want to visit. Because you can go there and they've, it's yeah. a park. Yeah. I think they've rebuilt part of it. Yeah. And they have the devastation to show the difference between the two. I'm sure they do. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. So after the series that Nali has done, hmm. can I say I can blame the British and the, some of the French? Yeah. For all that I have to endure today? Well, you know what? Yeah. 
there's the um, simple explanation. It's all the British's fault. This is a more complex situation of like, yeah. there's all this in trade. There's all these friction points between the two groups. Neither side wants to compromise on mm-hmm. the issues. But then you get to the end, the advance, then that's the kind of intermediate answer. And then you get to the end, the advanced answer is it's still the British's fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. in the end, they could have just traded for tea with China. Yeah. Like everybody, but they just, no, but they, want they, want, more. they want more. Yeah. Right. They want more. They're the empire. They got to complete the, you know. I just think it's, I think, I think really the main thing between all of this, having read thousands of pages of accounts of Mm. people of this time period, writing about it, writing lots of modern, reading lots of modern books about it. I really think at the core of it, the British were just pissed off Mm. that a country thought they were better than they were. Yeah. I really just think that's (laughs) what it is. I just think at the end of it. Yeah. I think they just. They left, the McCartney expedition happened, yeah. and for the next 70 years, they're like, those, mother- like those, how dare they? Yeah. Right? Like, how dare they not recognize, you know, the situation? Yeah. So let's show them. Yeah, let's show them, right? Yeah. That we, we have to humble them. There can only be one top dog emperor em- empire in this world. Yeah. And it has to be us. Yeah. Um, well, thank God those days are gone. Well, yeah. Although America might be taking a, <laughs> yeah. taking after its uh, footsteps in many I ways mean, or china yeah yeah i mean that's the show that's the show well, at least we don't call people barbarian well maybe during the trump presidency but at least we don't at least we don't call people barbarians in official correspondence yet i thought trump was the president yeah i said maybe during the trump presidency okay but not today anymore not no. biden yeah so yeah imperialism bad not good yeah controversial opinions <laughs> yeah. we always know to come for us from a controversial <laughs> opinion on the with chinese characters this podcast yeah. don't do imperialism yeah no, but nobody wins. Yeah, nobody wins. Nobody wins. If you listen to all of these, we really appreciate it. Anybody who rates us on anything or shares us with your friends, well, we mostly appreciate it. You can rate us on Apple Podcast. You can or rate us anywhere that has ratings. Well, uh, okay, sure. Yeah, you can rate us anywhere that has ratings, namely Apple Podcast and Spotify. Mm. It will be a great help. And uh, you know, write to us. Our email is on our website with ChineseCharacteristics dot com. We appreciate. We always enjoy reading your mail. Yeah, and look forward to our next episode on modern Chinese, quote unquote. Yeah. Democracy. Back to the voting, not. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for listening. See you next time.